Introduction to Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Father Ziley of Detroit. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Introduction Sketch of the Author's Life John Fox, or F-O-X-E, was born at Boston, in Lincolnshire, in 1517, where his parents are stated to have lived in respectable circumstances. He was deprived of his father at an early age, and notwithstanding his mother soon married again, he still remained under the parental roof. From an early display of talents and inclination to learning, his friends were induced to send him to Oxford, in order to cultivate and bring them to maturity. During his residence at this place he was distinguished for the excellence and acuteness of his intellect, which was improved by the emulation of his fellow collegians, united to an indefatigable zeal and industry on his part. These qualities soon gained him the admiration of all, and as a reward for his exertions and amiable conduct he was chosen fellow of Magdalen College, which was accounted a great honor in the university, and seldom bestowed unless in cases of great distinction. It appears that the first display of his genius was in poetry, and that he composed some Latin comedies which are still extant, but he soon directed his thoughts to a more serious subject, the study of the sacred scriptures. To divinity, indeed, he implied himself with more fervency than circumspection, and discovered his partiality to the Reformation, which had then commenced, before he was known to its supporters, or to those who protected them, a circumstance which proved to him the source of his first troubles. He is said to have often affirmed that the first matter which occasioned his search into the popish doctrine was that he saw diverse things, most repugnant in their nature to one another, forced upon men at the same time. Upon this foundation his resolution and intended obedience to that church were somewhat shaken, and by degrees a dislike to the rest took place. His first care was to look into both the ancient and modern history of the Church, to ascertain its beginning and progress, to consider the causes of all those controversies which in the meantime had sprung up, and diligently to weigh their effects, solidity, infirmities, etc. Before he had attained his thirtieth year he had studied the Greek and Latin fathers, and other learned authors the transactions of the councils and decrees of the consistories, and had acquired a very competent skill in the Hebrew language. In these occupations he frequently spent a considerable part, or even the whole, of the night, and in order to unbend his mind after such incessant study, he would resort to a grove near the college, a place much frequented by the students in the evening, on account of its sequestered gloominess. In these solitary walks he was often heard to ejaculate heavy sobs and sighs, and with tears to pour forth his prayers to God. These nightly retirements, in the sequel, gave rise to the first suspicion of his alienation from the Church of Rome. Being pressed for an explanation of this alteration in his conduct, he scorned to call in fiction to his excuse. He stated his opinions, and was by the sentence of the college, convicted, condemned as a heretic, and expelled. His friends, upon the report of this circumstance, were highly offended, when he was thus forsaken by his own friends, a refuge offered itself in the house of Sir Thomas Lucy, of Warwickshire, by whom he was sent for to instruct his children. The house is within easy walk of Stratford-on-Avon, and it was this estate which, a few years later, was the scene of Shakespeare's traditional boyish poaching expedition. Fox died when Shakespeare was three years old. 
In the Lucy house, Fox afterward married. But the fear of the popish inquisitors hastened his departure thence. As they were not contented to pursue public offences, but began also to dive into the secrets of private families. He now began to consider what was best to be done to free himself from further inconvenience, and resolved either to go to his wife's father or to his father-in-law. His wife's father was a citizen of Coventry, whose heart was not alienated from him, and he was more likely to be well entreated, or his daughter's sake. He resolved first to go to him, and in the meanwhile, by letters, to try whether his father-in-law would receive him or not. This he accordingly did, and he received for answer, quotes open, that it seemed to him a hard condition to take one into his house, whom he knew to be guilty and condemned for a capital offence, neither was he ignorant what hazard he should undergo in so doing. He would, however, show himself a kinsman, and neglect his own danger. If he would alter his mind, he might come, on condition to stay as long as he himself desired. But if he could not be persuaded to that, he must content himself with a shorter stay, and not bring him and his mother into danger. Quotes closed. No condition was to be refused. Besides, he was secretly advised by his mother to come, and not to fear his father-in-law's severity. Quotes open. For that, perchance, it was needful to write as he did, but when occasion should be offered, he would make recompense for his words with his actions. Quotes closed. In fact, he was better received by both of them than he had hoped for. By these means he kept himself concealed for some time, and afterwards made a journey to London, in the latter part of the reign of Henry the Eighth. Here, being unknown, he was in much distress and was even reduced to the danger of being starved to death, had not Providence interfered in his favor in the following manner. One day, as Mr. Fox was sitting in St. Paul's Church, exhausted with long fasting, a stranger took a seat by his side, and courteously saluted him, thrust a sum of money into his hand, and bade him cheer up his spirits. At the same time informing him, that in a few days new prospects would present themselves for his future subsistence. Who this stranger was he could never learn, but at the end of three days he received an invitation from the Duchess of Richmond to undertake the tuition of the children of the Earl of Surrey, who, together with his father, the Duke of Norfolk, was imprisoned in the tower by the jealousy and ingratitude of the king. The children thus confided to his care were Thomas, who succeeded to the dukedom, Henry, afterwards Earl of Northampton, and Jane, who became Countess of Westmoreland. In the performance of his duties he fully satisfied the expectations of the Duchess, their aunt. These halcyon days continued during the latter part of the reign of Henry the Eighth, and the five years of the reign of Edward the Sixth until Mary came to the crown, who, soon after her accession, gave all power into the hands of the papists. At this time Mr. Fox, who was still under the protection of his noble pupil, the Duke, began to excite the envy and hatred of many, particularly Dr. Gardiner, then Bishop of Winchester, who in the sequel became his most violent enemy. Mr. Fox, aware of this, and seeing the dreadful persecutions then commencing, began to think of quitting the kingdom. As soon as the duke knew his intention, he endeavored to persuade him to remain, and his arguments were so powerful, and given with so much sincerity, that he gave up the thought of abandoning his asylum for the present. At that time the Bishop of Winchester was very intimate with the duke, by the patronage of whose family he had risen to the dignity he then enjoyed, and frequently waited on him to present his service, when he several times requested that he might see his old tutor. At first the duke denied his request, at one time alleging his absence, at another indisposition. At length it happened that Mr. Fox, not knowing the bishop was in the house, entered the room where the duke and he were in discourse, and seeing the bishop, withdrew. 
Gardiner asked who that was. The Duke answered that he was his physician, who was somewhat uncourtly, as being new come from the university. "'I like his countenance and aspect very well,' replied the bishop, "'and when occasion offers I will send for him.' The Duke understood that speech as the messenger of some approaching danger, and now himself thought it high time for Mr. Fox to quit the city and even the country. He accordingly caused everything necessary for his flight to be provided in silence, by sending one of his servants to Ipswich to hire a bark and prepare all the requisites for his departure. He also fixed on the house of one of his servants, who was a farmer, where he might lodge until the wind became favorable, and everything being in readiness, Mr. Fox took leave of his noble patron, and with his wife, who was pregnant at the time, secretly departed for the ship. The vessel was scarcely under sail, when a most violent storm came on, which lasted all day and night, and the next day drove them back to the port from which they had departed. During the time that the vessel had been at sea, an officer dispatched by the Bishop of Winchester had broken open the house of the farmer, with a warrant to apprehend Mr. Fox wherever he might be found, and bring him back to the city. On hearing this news he hired a horse, under the pretense of leaving the town immediately, but secretly returned the same night, and agreed with the captain of the vessel to sail for any place as soon as the wind should shift, only desired him to proceed and not to doubt that God would prosper his undertaking. The mariner suffered himself to be persuaded, and within two days landed his passengers in safety at Newport. After spending a few days in that place, Mr. Fox set out for Basel, where he found a number of English refugees who had quitted their country to avoid the cruelty of the persecutors. With these he associated, and began to write his History of the Acts and Monuments of the Church, which was first published in Latin at Basel in 1554, and in English in 1563. In the meantime, the Reformed religion began again to flourish in England, and the Popish faction much to decline by the death of Queen Mary, which induced the greater number of the Protestant exiles to return to their native country. Among others, on the accession of Elizabeth to the throne, Mr. Fox returned to England, where, on his arrival, he found a faithful and active friend in his late pupil, the Duke of Norfolk, until death deprived him of his benefactor, after which event Mr. Fox inherited a pension bequeathed to him by the Duke, and ratified by his son, the Earl of Suffolk. Nor did the good man's successes stop here. On being recommended to the Queen by her Secretary of State, the great Cecil, Her Majesty granted him the prebendary of Shipton, in the Cathedral of Salisbury, which was in a manner forced upon him for it was with difficulty that he could be persuaded to accept it. On his resettlement in England, he employed himself in revising and enlarging his admirable martyrology. With prodigious pains and constant study, he completed that celebrated work in eleven years. For the sake of greater correctness, he wrote every line of this vast book with his own hand, and transcribed all the records and papers himself. But in consequence of such excessive toil, leaving no part of his time free from study, nor affording himself either the repose or recreation which nature required, his health was so reduced, and his person became so emaciated and altered, that such of his friends and relations as only conversed with him occasionally could scarcely recognize his person. Yet, though he grew daily more exhausted, he proceeded in his studies as briskly as ever, nor would he be persuaded to diminish his accustomed labors. The papists, foreseeing how detrimental his history of their errors and cruelties would prove to their cause, had recourse to every artifice to lessen the reputation of his work. But their malice was of signal service, both to Mr. Fox himself and to the Church of God at large, as it eventually made his book more intrinsically valuable, by inducing him to weigh with the most scrupulous attention 
the certainty of the facts which he recorded and the validity of the authorities from which he drew his information. But while he was thus indefatigably employed in promoting the cause of truth, he did not neglect the other duties of his station. He was charitable, humane, and attentive to the wants, both spiritual and temporal, of his neighbors. With the view of being more extensively useful, although he had no desire to cultivate the acquaintance of the rich and great on his own account, he did not decline the friendship of those in a higher rank who proffered it, and never failed to employ his influence with them in behalf of the poor and needy. In consequence of his well-known probity and charity, he was frequently presented with sums of money by persons possessed of wealth, which he accepted and distributed among those who were distressed. He would also occasionally attend the table of his friends, not so much for the sake of pleasure as from civility, and to convince them that his absence was not occasioned by a fear of being exposed to the temptations of the appetite. In short, his character as a man and as a Christian was without reproach. Although the recent recollection of the persecutions under Bloody Mary gave bitterness to his pen, it is singular to note that he was personally the most conciliatory of men, and that while he heartily disowned the Roman church in which he was born, he was one of the first to attempt the concord of the Protestant brethren. In fact, he was a veritable apostle of toleration. When the plague or pestilence broke out in England in 1563, and many forsook their duties, Fox remained at his post, assisting the friendless and acting as the almsgiver of the rich. It was said of him that he could never refuse help to any one who asked it in the name of Christ. Tolerant and large-hearted, he exerted his influence with Queen Elizabeth to confirm her intention to no longer keep up the cruel practice of putting to death those of opposing religious convictions. The Queen held him in respect, and referred to him as, quotes open, our father Fox, quotes closed. Mr. Fox had joy in the fruits of his work while he was yet alive. It passed through four large editions before his decease, and it was ordered by the bishops to be placed in every cathedral church in England, where it was often found chained, as the Bible was in those days, to a lectern for the access of the people. At length, having long served both the church and the world by his ministry, by his pen, and by the unsullied luster of a benevolent, useful, and holy life, he meekly resigned his soul to Christ on the 18th of April, 1587, being then in the seventieth year of his age. He was interred in the chancel of St. Giles, Cripplegate, of which parish he had been, in the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, for some time vicar. End of Introduction Recording by Father Ziley, Detroit, Michigan D-R-Z-E-I-L-E -E dot net Read March 2009 Chapter 1 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 1 by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 1. History of Christian Martyrs to the First General Persecutions under Nero. Christ, our Saviour, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, hearing the confession of Simon Peter, who first of all other openly acknowledged him to be the Son of God, and perceiving the secret hand of his father therein, called him alluding to his name, a rock, upon which rock he would build, his church so strong that the gates of hell should not prevail against it. In which words three things are to be noted. First, that Christ will have a church in this world. Secondly, that the same church should mightily be impugned, not only by the world, but also by the uttermost strengths and powers of all hell. And thirdly, that the same church, notwithstanding the uttermost, 
of the devil and all his malice, should continue. Which prophecy of Christ we see wonderfully to be verified, insomuch that the whole course of the church to this day may seem nothing else but a verifying of the said prophecy. First, that Christ has set up a church, needeth no declaration. Secondly, what force of princes, kings, monarchs, governors, and rulers of this world, with their subjects, publicly and privately, with all their strength and cunning, have bent themselves against this church? And thirdly, how the said church, all this notwithstanding, has yet endured and holden its own? What storms and tempests it has overpassed, wondrous it is to behold. For the more evident declaration whereof, I have addressed this present history, to the end first, that the wonderful works of God in his church might appear to his glory, also that the continuance and proceedings of the church, from time to time, being set forth, more knowledge and experience may rebound thereby, to the profit of the reader and edification of Christian faith. As it is not our business to enlarge upon our Saviour's history, either before or after his crucifixion, we shall only find it necessary to remind our readers of the discomfiture of the Jews by his subsequent resurrection. Although one apostle had betrayed him, although another had denied him, under the solemn sanction of an oath, and although the rest had forsaken him, unless we may accept the disciple who was known unto the high priest, the history of his resurrection gave a new direction to all their hearts, and after the mission of the Holy Spirit, imparted new confidence to their minds. The powers with which they were endued emboldened them to proclaim his name, to the confusion of the Jewish rulers, and the astonishment of Gentile proselytes. First, St. Stephen. St. Stephen suffered the next in order. His death was occasioned by the faithful manner in which he preached the gospel to the betrayers and murderers of Christ. To such a degree of madness were they excited, that they cast him out of the city and stoned him to death. The time when he suffered is generally supposed to have been at the Passover, which succeeded to that of our Lord's crucifixion, and to the era of his ascension in the following spring. Upon this a great persecution was raised against all who professed their belief in Christ as the Messiah or as a prophet. We are immediately told by St. Luke that there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and that they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. About two thousand Christians, with Nicanor, one of the seven diacons, suffered martyrdom during the persecution that arose about Stephen. Second, James the Great. The next martyr we meet with, according to St. Luke, in the history of the Apostles' Acts, was James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John, and a relative of our Lord. For his mother Salome was cousin German to the Virgin Mary. It was not until ten years after the death of Stephen, that the second martyrdom took place. For no sooner had Herod Agrippa been appointed governor of Judea, than, with a view to ingratiate himself with them, he raised a sharp persecution against the Christians, and determined to make an effectual blow by striking at their leaders. The account given us by an eminent primitive writer, Clemens Alexandrinus, ought not to be overlooked, that, as James was led to the place of martyrdom, his accuser was brought to repent of his conduct by the apostle's extraordinary courage and undauntedness, and fell down at his feet to request his pardon, professing himself a Christian, and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Hence they were both beheaded at the same time. Thus did the first apostolic martyr cheerfully and resolutely receive that cup, which he had told our Saviour he was ready to drink. Timon and Parmenas suffered martyrdom about the same time, the one at Philippi and the other in Macedonia. These events took place A.D. 44. 3. Philip Was born at Bethsaida in Galilee, and was first called by the name of disciple. 
he laboured diligently in Upper Asia, and suffered martyrdom at Heliopolis in Phrygia. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Anno Domini 54. 4. Matthew. Whose occupation was that of Tolgatherer, was born at Nazareth. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew, which was afterwards translated into Greek by James the Less. The scene of his labors was Parthia and Ethiopia, in which latter country he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd in the city of Nadabach, and on Dominic sixty. 5. James the Less is supposed by some to have been the brother of our Lord, by a former wife of Joseph. This is very doubtful, and accords too much with the Catholic superstition that Mary never had any other children except our Saviour. He was elected to the oversight of the churches of Jerusalem, and was the author of the epistle ascribed to James in the sacred canon. At the age of ninety-four he was beaten and stoned by the Jews, and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. 6. Matthias, of whom less is known than of most of the other disciples, was elected to fill the vacant place of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem, and then beheaded. 7. Andrew, was the brother of Peter. He preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations, but on his arrival at Edessa, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. Hence the derivation of the term, St. Andrew's Cross. 8. St. Mark Was born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi. He is supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, whom he served as an amanuensis, and under whose inspection he wrote his gospel in the Greek language. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria, at the great solemnity of Serapis, their idol, ending his life under their merciless hands. 9. Peter Among many other saints, the blessed Apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do write, at Rome, albeit some others, and not without cause, do doubt thereof. Hegesippus says, that Nero sought matter against Peter to put him to death, which, when the people perceived, they entreated Peter with much ado that he would fly the city. Peter, through their importunity at length persuaded, prepared himself to avoid. But coming to the gate, he saw the Lord Christ come to meet him, to whom he, worshipping, said, Lord, whither dost thou go? To whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter, perceiving his suffering to be understood, returned into the city. Jerome says that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, himself so requiring, because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified, after the same form and manner as the Lord was. 10. Paul Paul's apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in this first persecution under Nero. Abdias declares that under his execution Nero sent two of his esquires, Ferega and Parsimius, to bring him word of his death. They, coming to Paul instructing the people, desired him to pray for them, that they might believe, who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptized at his sepulchre. This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution, where he, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. 11. Jude The brother of James was commonly called Thaddeus. He was crucified at Edessa, Anno Domini 72. 12. Bartholomew Preached in several countries, and having translated the Gospel of Matthew into the language of India, he propagated it in that country. He was at length cruelly beaten, and then crucified by the impatient idolaters. 13. Thomas, called Didymus, preached the Gospel in Parthia and India, where, exciting the rage of the pagan priests, he was murdered by being thrust through with a spear. 14. Luke, the evangelist, 
was the author of the gospel which goes under his name. He travelled with Paul through various countries, and is supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests of Greece. 15. Simon Surnamed Zelotes, preached the gospel in Mauritania, Africa, and even in Britain, in which latter country he was crucified, Anno Domini, 74. 16. John The beloved disciple was brother to James the Great. The churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Theatira were founded by him. From Ephesus he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it is affirmed he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped by miracle without injury. Domitian afterwards banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the Book of Revelation. Nerva, the successor of Domitian, recalled him. He was the only apostle who escaped a violent death. 17. Barnabas Was of Kepros, but of Jewish descent. His death is supposed to have taken place about Anno Domini 73. And yet, notwithstanding all these continual persecutions and horrible punishments, the church daily increased, deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and of men apostolical, and watered plenteously with the blood of saints. End of chapter 1